Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being with us here on this cold fall morning. Would you please stand as we begin to worship together this morning? Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope. Like wildfire in our very souls, Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. Seek your kingdom first. sick, the poor at least. We lay down our lives for heaven's call. We are your church. We pray revive this. Build your kingdom. turn each other and welcome each other here this morning. Well, good morning. I'd like to extend my welcome to you this morning. We're glad that you've joined us for worship. My name is Pastor Barry. And I'm just going to highlight a few announcements for you if you want to take your bulletins that you received when you came in. The, for those of you who are new to our church, your first time visitor, or have maybe been here just for a short season, I encourage you to take the uh, welcome card that's there in the pew in front of you and just let us know 
that you've joined us for worship. We promise this is not to spam you. It's just about finding who's joining us in worship. And if you have a desire to connect with the pastors or other staff, you can just fill that out on the card and place it in the offering plates as you uh, leave the sanctuary today. Well, today is the day that our partnership classes begin. And so we have some people that are uh, set to take that. But if you have just heard about this and, oh, wait, I'd like to find out more about this Free Methodist Church and uh, what we believe and where we're headed, you're welcome to join us. Following church, we're going to head downstairs to the Fellowship Hall for uh, light lunch and an, a time of our class. Well, you'll note your bulletin is perhaps a little heavier today. Today is Tear Fun Sunday. And so I just want to give a bit of a framework. Tear Fund is a world relief agency that partners with Christian organizations around the world that we, not only as a local Free Methodist Church, but as a church in Canada, work through Tear Fund uh, to support relief efforts in different places around the world. Now, a plus why we use Tear Fund is because Tear Fund. Uh, for every dollar that someone donates to Tear Fund to be used in world relief, uh, they're connected with the world food grain banks, particularly the Canadian branch. So it ends up doubling the money. So I think it's a great investment when we talk about helping different situations. And for those of you who are, you know, regularly connected to First Free Methodist, you might remember it was through Tear Fund that we gave support for the work that was happening in the Ukraine and the leadership in Tier Fund let me know that they have received sort of all the money that they can use and then some. And so now today we're going to hear about some other things that are happening in northern Africa with a terrible famine that's taking place there and terrible, terrible devastation that really hasn't been in the news of late. So we're going to talk about that and I'll be sharing that in my message. Well, trick shots and treats is coming up. And I know Pastor Patty wanted me to share to say last week in her exuberance, she said, we have all we need for workers, but she meant to say, <laughs> we have all the stations filled, but we can always use more help. So October 29, we're having trick shots and treats here in the parking lot of the church. So it's a rain or shine deal. There's more details in the bulletin, 10 a.m. till noon. It's going to be a fun celebration to invite the folks in our community to participate. We've already had Good response, not only from you to serve, but also people from the community expressing interest to come and take part. So that'll be a fun time that you can join us. If you have come prepared uh, to give your tithes and your offerings this morning, um, I encourage you to, as you're done, you can put your mon and money, if you have a check or cash, in the plates as you leave. There's also some ways to give electronically that are listed and explained on the back of the bulletin. And while we're talking about giving, just to direct you to how we're going to be giving through uh, our, our time for Tear Fund, that'll be at the end of the service. That piece that you received actually has two things. It should have a little envelope, which is postage paid. And then you're actually, if you're giving to Tear Fund today, or if you want to take that home, take it home and make the donation out directly to Tear Fund. But there is a, a spot on your card here that actually says the church. So that way, if you say, this is the church I was at when I heard about Tear Fund, what Tear Fund does is then tells us as a church, you've had so many people participate and this amount of dollars were donated. But we'd prefer as our leadership to have the money go directly to Tear Fund as opposed to giving to First Free Methodist and then have to relay it on. It makes the work of our bookkeeper and a treasurer and office people a lot easier. Just send the money directly through this material here. And with that, I'll take a breath. <sighs> and we're going to continue in worship through the reading of God's Word, and I'd ask Matt to come. I invite you to stand as you are able out of reverence for God's Word. This morning, I'll be reading from Psalm 121 and the New Revised Standard Version. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. 
He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. stand as we continue to worship together.
gathered together to lift up your name, to call you Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you. Here in the power of Christ I stand. 
be seated. Thank you, Hudson and worship team. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. So I've got a little story for you this morning that I thought I had up on here already. Here we go. Um, it's a story about a pencil. The pencil maker took the pencil aside just before putting him into the box. There are five things you should know, he told the pencil, before I send you out into the world. Always remember them and you will have the best pencil ever. You will be the best pencil ever. So first of all, you will do many great things if you allow yourself to be held in someone's hand. You will experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but you will need it to become a better pencil. You will be able to correct any mistakes you make with the eraser at the end. And the most important part of you is always, always going to be on the inside. And number five, on every surface you are used upon, you're going to leave your mark. No matter what the condition of the surface, you must continue to write. The pencil understood and promised to never forget, and he went into the box with purpose in his heart. I'm going to call the kids up at this time and ask you to line up at the door behind Delilah, who's going to take you downstairs for a wonderful time of growing together. Would you join with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, you are holy and worthy of all praise and honor and glory. And we come before you now in our tiredness, in our brokenness, in our pain, and we lay our sins down at your feet. And we confess, Lord, that those sins, those things that we've laid there, they pull us away from you, and we ask that you take them away from us, that you forgive us, and that we would seek out to be redeemed in you. And Lord, we are so thankful for your goodness and your love that allows us, that does forgive us, and that cares about us and seeks after our hearts. And I would just pray, Lord, that as we as we learn, dive into this message, that our our hearts would be opened, our, our eyes and our ears would be opened to what you would have us learn today, how you would mold us and shape us into your people, into the people who seek after your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And we also just lift up those who are in pain, Lord, those who are tired, those who need your hand of protection, your hand of guidance your hand of peace. I pray that we would come alongside those people and support them and love them as you support and love us. And finally, I just lift up Pastor Barry as he brings the message today. Allow it to work in our hearts and be glorifying and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Well, this past week I had a couple of old friends, and uh, I can say that they were older than me by a little piece. Not, not by much, but old enough. College friends, they were on their way through, and so they, they dropped by. And we spoke about oh, the past couple of years, and they were sharing about the crazy moments that we've been experiencing. They talked about some of the challenges they faced in their community, and 
and we talked about what was happening here. And kind of I rejoiced, you know, as one of the things was the pandemic and we talked about how Saskatchewan was able to lift restrictions earlier and I shared the thing you may have seen before, Saskatchewan was practicing social distancing since 1906. Maybe you've seen that before. It got me thinking of some of the other harsh realities for many people, wondering, you know, where in the world all this is happening and, and trying to make sense of it. It's been frustrating moments over the past number of years. Lack of connection for people, and we're coming through that, thankfully. We got thinking, and I was thinking of some people that have had to say goodbye to loved ones and not able to be there. They were sharing about a friend of theirs that passed away, and they couldn't be a part of the funeral service. They had to kind of watch through a video screen. What an odd thing because of the things that were taking place. And then the other reality that people experienced, new experiences perhaps, at least for me, uh, perhaps maybe for you, was shortages where uh, many items that seemed to be in great abundance before were then not there, problems with supply chains, and that meant changes of what you found on the store shelves. And then uh, you t talk about when people are able finally to get back together, then there's this hesitancy. And there's a nervousness about it now where, you know, is the person that you're with healthy? Are they going to make you sick? Uh, you know, it, and now it seems like any time, you know, I have allergies and asthma and so, and perhaps some of you do, and any time there's a cough, it's almost like all eyes zook right onto you and, and you're having to say, it's not COVID, it's okay, it's just allergies. You have to explain it. That's a new reality for us. And then... Uh, you talk about the world economies and things of, you know, things like the soaring interest rates that are happening and the housing prices that have just seemed to skyrocket, which has caused other strains on, for example, local food banks across the country. They're expressing strains they have not had to deal with before like they are now. More and more people needing help to find food to, to feed their families or feed themselves. And all of that can bring about this sense of angst and what I would say is hopelessness. And perhaps maybe in reflective moments you felt that yourself. All of those problems we've seen from other places in our world. And then to think of this, that uh, as I shared earlier in the announcements, 300 million people, over 300 million people that have slipped back into extreme poverty. Where, you know, the, these price increases have taken away their ability to, to afford basic necessities. For many, as I was sharing, or Don Miller, uh, the church representation for Tear Fund was, is a friend of mine from Arlington Woods days, my home church in Ottawa, and he was talking about Barry the need in, in, in Kenya and Ethiopia and Sudan, it's greater than it's ever been. There's just so many things happening. So he shared about the struggles that people were having. Like, because of these financial issues, things like trying to buy flour and cooking oil, the changing weather patterns that have kind of come upon the same time as COVID have decimated farmers where they would have livestock before because they didn't have feed to feed those animals. They lost those animals. They died. And they there are wrestling with the same things that we do to a greater extent, of course, asking the question, where is the hope? Where is the hope when everything around seems hopeless? When it's difficult to see a way out and you look to the future, so much uncertainty, so much that's unsettled. You know, food shortages, destructive weather, disasters, throwing everything upside down. It's jarring. But then Don started to share and our, our partners, our friends at Tier Fund Canada are working with agencies and again, particularly in some of the places, so thinking of rural Kenya some of the realities in rural Kenya right now, it's normal to be hungry. I mean, that's these friends that dropped by this week, we talked about, you know, one of the angst they shared was 
oh, you know, I wanted to stop by a restaurant in Medicine Hat and it was closed because of Thanksgiving. First world problems. Because in rural Kenya, it's normal to be with, without food. It's normal to be hungry. Unpredictable rains have caused this constant worry about water. And so then as farmers are trying to grow crops, then there's crop failures. Not only all of that, but in Kenya, then there's this, this belief that the government will help, and yet they struggle to do that. They never do. And so then that creates this political tension about the people that are in office, in power, with those that don't, don't have it. And so disunity then cuts across multiple levels of people's lives. And there's further angst and upset. The question is, where is the hope for the average person there who's trying to survive? It's not about prospering and being rich and wealthy. It's about just survival. Maybe you think yourself, you know, where is the hope in the middle of your area of crisis or where things are uncertain in your life? The trouble is, when we lose hope, what happens is fear begins to creep in and we end up living in fearful times. Fear of new viruses, of unknown sickness. When you watch the news and you see, you know, fear of conflicts as we think about Ukraine and what those next steps will be and how will it escalate and the uneasiness that that causes and fear of inflation, this bringing about of further financial uncertainty, fear of climate changes and unpredictable weather. How do we turn that back? And fear of living with so many unknowns. Fear becomes this virus that that eats away at people, eats away at us. And it paralyzes individuals, it paralyzes families, communities, and even countries. And it holds people back from seeing a way out. But God gives us hope. God's inoculation to the virus of fear, shall we say, is hope. Now, the true meaning of hope has almost been lost. We use it casually. We talk about, you know, oh, I have hope that my sports team will win. I hope that the Toronto Maple Leafs will win the Stanley Cup. Some may say that's a false hope, especially if you're a Habs fan. But then the Habs fans are saying, oh, dear. You know, I hope that, you know, my friend arrives in time for supper. I, I hope I can find a parking spot as I... You know, we use this word, hope, in such a limited way. We use the word really with reference to our desires about outcomes we would like to see in a situation. And as you go to the dictionary definition, hope is defined as, a, as to cherish a desire with anticipation. You're wanting something to happen or to be true. But I want to say that that kind of hope is based on uncertainty. But really, biblical hope, God's hope, is knowing that a desired outcome will happen. It's not wishful thinking. It's confident expectation. That's what the Apostle Paul talked about. That's what Jesus talked about. And so in Matthew's Gospel, we find Jesus speaking with a rich young man who asks Jesus an honest question. Let me read to you this morning. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, and I'm going to start reading at verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired, kind of trying to narrow Jesus down like a lawyer, isn't he? Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. 
Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With, this, with man this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, We've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you will have followed me. You who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who, for, who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. This rich young ruler, this young man was, was maybe searching because he had tried other ways to find happiness. So he comes to Jesus, and I think perhaps struggling with fear, like we do sometimes, that he's looking for this inner peace that he doesn't have. We know from this passage, as we hear him described as a rich young man, that he was well-educated, so he knew the commandments as Jesus listed off what needed to be done. He knew those commandments from a young age. He'd been taught the law. He'd been taught those other traditions. And as he says, he has lived those out. And we know he's very wealthy. He mostly, uh, most likely sort of had a lot of people to cater to his every desire, being that he was wealthy. Any demand that he had, he could ask his servants and they'd respond. He didn't have to worry about his next meal or, you know, where it would come from. He had all his physical needs taken care of. And as Matthew writes, he has been living this moral life. He's doing what he is supposed to, keeping the standards that are expected of a good Jewish person. And in his question of Jesus, he's really seeking for assurance of his life. He's asking this soul-searching question because he has this sense of something is missing. As we think about it, we could say that this rich young ruler, he lacked hope. And so he comes to Jesus to say, can you just put my mind at ease, Jesus? And Jesus gives him an answer that he fears the most. Jesus turns to the rich young ruler and says, give up your security. Give up your wealth. Give up those things that you have been holding on to, that you think matter. Give up your treasures on earth so that you can have treasures in heaven as you open up your heart. And those sobering words we read is that the rich young ruler hung his head down and he went away sad. And there was one thing he could not do because he was so held by those earthly treasures. Or should I say, they held on to him so greatly. And that sometimes the things that we love the most, the very things are the very things that prevent us from moving forward in our journey with Christ. Maybe, as you think about it, it could be a job that you have and you enjoy, but maybe it's limiting what God has for you, limiting your potential. Maybe it's a habit that's become destructive. Maybe it's a way of thinking that you have, perhaps even enjoy, but that is keeping you from moving forward. Jesus speaks to his disciples after the rich young ruler leaves 
And they have been watching and listening to this interchange, this whole conversation. And I have this sense that they're probably keenly fascinated by this meeting. Because as they looked to this young man as he came, he would have had the vestiges of wealth. His, his attire would have been, you know, oh, look at his clothing. Look at the, the linens that he wears, the, the robes that he has on. Here is a rich man. They would have also had, you know, maybe turned to the crowd and seen people who were polar opposite, people who lacked everything. They lived in poverty. They, they were standing right beside this rich young ruler. But you know what? I think that Jesus' answer perhaps surprised the disciples because they thought, you know what? If he can't be saved, this rich man can't be saved, you know, what's going on? Because Clearly, isn't the, the way that God works is he's rich because God has blessed him. And God's blessing is shown through the sign of wealth. Wow. Aren't those who are rich supposed to be filled with hope, Jesus? So if he can't be saved, who can be saved, Jesus? And Jesus unpacks what God's hope looks like. And when it will be a reality. In this passage, let's take a look particularly verse 28 to 30. Where Jesus says, you know, he's looking to, to this, this rich young ruler. And he says, it's not only for rich young rulers. It's not just for you, my disciples, who are fishermen and left your boats. But it's for each and every one. For everyone who embraces Jesus' life and walks in it. This is a hope that you can cling to with certainty. When Jesus begins this phrase, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things. Well, let's just stop there. What does that mean? At the renewal of all things. Jesus just casually drops this phrase that perhaps we don't understand as readily as his listeners would have. Because those who were listening, that was filled with meaning. Something big for them. See, for the Jewish people that were listening to Jesus, that tied directly in to the Old Testament prophet's message from the Lord. The prophet Isaiah talked about God's renewing. And so we see in Isaiah 51, "...the ransom of the Lord will return." They will enter Zion or Jerusalem with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Some of you maybe remember, like me in this moment, the song. Do you remember that old chorus? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. Some of you don't. Okay. And come with singing. Sorry. And then Isaiah 65, the prophet says, God's message, Behold, I will create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. The key word that the prophet is delivering to Jerusalem, who are experiencing difficulty and hardship, they're living in exile, the word is renewal. Renewal. In the Greek language, it is the word palangenesia. And you might recognize that last part of the word genesia. It's this two word, palin is again, and genesia is beginning. So we think of Genesia, first book of the Bible is Genesis, in the beginning. The Garden of Eden, that perfect place. So think of Genesis again, or maybe another way that we can frame it is Eden restored. That beautiful time. Now in the Greek way of thinking, this is something that is happening cyclically. They had this idea that, you know, just making life a bit better, and so it happened over and over. 
But where is the hope for those who are in despair? Jesus says, when he sits on the throne, there will be the renewal of all things. Jesus is saying the philosophers, those Greek thinkers, got it wrong. This is not a reset of the broken world like resetting a computer. You know, like if you call for help or you follow the instructions on most technical things, most service technicians will ask the question, have you tried turning it off and on again? Isaiah is delivering the message about a renewal, a rebirth of God's world. Not a reset that's got to be reset again and again and had a power outage, okay, turn it off, turn it on again. No, it's a one time that Jesus at his return, as he sits on the throne, one time renewal of all things. That's our great hope. You can be sure of it. For the rich and the poor, for those who have comfort, those who are living in poverty, for those who are living in despair today, there is this great and real hope. Just think of the book of Revelation as John sees the vision of heaven and he talks about that. He speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. This morning, we're going to hear from a lady from Kenya named Francesca, who lives in rural Kenya, and her life was without hope. Let's hear her story now. My name is Francisca Chuma. I am 34 years old. My husband died in 2019, and he is survived by five children. When my husband died, our business did not perform well. I couldn't pay rent for two months and was consequently locked out of my house. The only work I had was to cut firewood and sell tomatoes. When a parent doesn't know where the next meal will come from, this contributes a lot of stress. In rural Kenya, life is dry and harsh. Years of drought has left families struggling to survive. Yet, even in the most desperate of circumstances, there is hope. I once attended a local get-together hosted by Tia Fund's partner, Fadili. I liked the group, and I later joined Fadili in 2020, and we started farming. This kind of farming amazed me. If you compare the old site versus the new site where I do conservation agriculture, there is a big difference. One is dry, whilst one is green, despite the current hot and dry season. Before Fadili, I farmed and harvested very little foods. After Fadili, I have harvested 50 kilograms of beans and also maize from the small farm. We usually take them from planting up to harvesting and then how they can market their products. I like seeing farmers change from one thing that traditional or a cultural thing they, they usually hold on to and do new innovations. And uh, I've seen families get food. I joined a women's savings group. Fadili has benefited me such that I can borrow loans after savings. These loans boost me. I buy food for the children, pay school fees, and buy three chickens. Without the project, I would be in Nairobi struggling for my children. What this project has revealed to me is that the economy of the community can be improved. This project can be the solution to many problems faced by the community at large. The church also helps both me and my children. Even now, my child has a school fee balance and the church says they will help in how to pay the balance. I can only thank God because he has brought me this far. It is not by my strength or might, it is by the grace of God. Thanks to training in new farming practices and her savings group, Francisca and her children have been able to adapt to climate challenges and survive the hunger crisis. With the help of the local church, 
they are taking their first steps out of poverty. But many families still find themselves in desperate situations. Today, you can bring renewed hope to thousands in need. Thank you for your support. As I said at the beginning in the announcements, Tear Fund partners with other Christian ministries all over the world. In Kenya, it's that organization that's called Fadili Trust. And there's this gifted team of people uh, and a strong network of committed volunteers. And they're working with the, the, the most vulnerable in rural Kenya. They bring hope through savings groups, as you saw in the video. And I was excited to see about those you know, teaching about sustainable agricultural practices that help them as they work through uh, people through the church to be sure that they're, they're to have this certain hope. Francesca's story is one that can be told over and over again, and it's across many parts of the world. This idea of her husband dying and her life being devastated, and then life becomes a daily struggle in those situations. And she was overwhelmed you know, what was she to do? She was hopeless. In that place of hopelessness, it can be so overwhelming. But then, thankfully, she connected with the Tear Fund partner, Fidili, and she found hope. And those new farming methods, Don was saying that, you know, even though the, the climate situations are dire, those that have learned these techniques actually are still able to have their land produced. They're able to care for their crops in a much better way than others without the training. And she learned those new farming methods. And then that radically changed the way she farmed. And with great results, she was able to then provide for her family. And then with an increase in money, I love that the church comes around that community of people and shows them, well, here's how to be good stewards uh, through this village saving group, that they help them learn how to save, how to borrow, and how to pay back. Notice it didn't say the church paid back, but taught me how I could pay this back. The ongoing center of her story is that church, as they share this message of palangesia this, and hope where God is in control and followers of Christ have eternity planted in her heart. So there's this practical side of the gospel of coming alongside of Francesca and her situation, but then giving her the gospel as well through sharing Christ hand in hand. So she now has this renewed hope. So today, we are invited as a church to join in what God is doing, giving people the hope that they need, bringing hope in the middle of despair. We can do that through a one-time gift, giving monthly, a one-time gift. We're joining with other Christ followers to respond to where the need is greatest. And again, just a reminder that as we, you know, connect with Tear Fund, I just love that they are, you know, connected with the Food Grains Bank so we, we get more bang for our buck. So as we together today join with other churches across Canada, not just Free Methodist, Tear Fund Sunday is something that's going, um, encouraged today through multiple denominations, then we join together and see greater results. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we think about our situation and where we would be without you, we have to say thank you. And there's also this sense, Holy Spirit, of times where we maybe felt that fear has infected our hearts, that virus has robbed us of our joy and our hope. But God, thank you for your word. And Jesus, as you say, that we have a certain hope not a wishful thinking hope. Thank you for the ministry of Tear Fund and the work that they're doing in rural Kenya and Ethiopia and Sudan and all over the world. Lord God, I pray that you would bless the ministry and the work that they do, bringing hope and transformation to so many people. We ask that you would help us. God, bless the, 
the money that you prompt us, Holy Spirit, to give. And I'm just reminded again, Lord God, that you're, you're not guilting us to give. You want us to give cheerfully. And so if we don't feel that we can give or should give, you say, don't worry about it. You say to those who are prompted by the Spirit and respond out of that grace, give freely and cheerfully. So we pray that you would take these love offerings that we would give to Tear Fund, that you would bless them and bless the work that's happening so we can further see your hope transform our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.